Good afternoon and welcome to the Tax Support for Professionals afternoon webinar. I'm Jeff Weber, one of the tax line consultants, and I also happen to be the first speaker today. We will be covering some hot topic news items first, followed by slightly more detailed commentary on two topics, namely Brexit essentials and HMRC nudge letters. There will be time at the end for a question and answer session. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. Oh, we're there. Um, sorry, Chris, could you go back one slide? Uh, this summarizes the, the items I've mentioned to you. News, Brexit essentials, nudge letters, and Q&As. Next slide, please, Chris. Uh, here, here are uh, three of your speakers, myself, Mark Ellis, my colleague who will be covering the VAT aspects of the hot news topics, and also um, uh, Matthew Watkins, who will be covering nudge letters. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just the header for news items. We start with the uh, hot topics on direct taxes. Turning first to some of these news items, this is essentially just a brief heads up on some topics covered by the Chancellor's announcements in November of some additional Finance Bill 2021 clauses in his, quote, not the autumn budget statement. There were quite a large number of draft clauses included, and amongst other things, they covered AIA, where there was a very welcome announcement that the one million pound limit for AIA is to be extended from 1 January 2021 to 1 January 2022. In other words, an extra year for people to buy in that plant and machinery. Uh, another interesting topic was uh, there is a draft clause concerning a requirement for large businesses to notify any uncertain tax treatment well, this is particularly controversial and quite possibly a foot in the door so that it would not just stay with large businesses. But as you can imagine, hard lobbying has already commenced and it remains, remains to be seen how, that, how that's gonna pan out. Um, moving on now to a couple of topics that I wanted to cover in a little more detail as they will be of direct interest to all the participants in this webinar. Uh, the first one concerns virtual Christmas parties for staff. Helpfully, HMRC has entered into the Christmas spirit by confirming that the costs of an annual function provided virtually using IT will qualify as an exempt benefit for staff. This means the costs of providing food, entertainment, equipment, and other expenses in hosting a virtual event will be exempt, provided all normal conditions are satisfied. These include the requirement that the function must be available to employees generally, or to all the employees generally at one location where the employer has more than one location. And as ever, the cost of the event per head must not exceed 150 pounds inclusive of VAT, or must not exceed 150 in aggregate if there are two or more annual functions in a year, for example, a Christmas party and a summer party. HMRC gives an example of a situation where a company holds just one annual function in a tax year, say a Christmas party, and this year does so virtually using IT. All employees are invited and each is provided with a hamper, including some food and drink to be enjoyed by the attendees, the total cost per head is £100, and as this is within the £150 exemption, the uh, virtual party is exempt. We should not forget that HMRC will still apply the rules strictly. For example, giving restaurant vouchers to staff for £100 would not fall within the exemption, as vouchers that can be exchanged for goods and services, in other words, non-cash vouchers, are treated as a taxable benefit in kind, although there is an exemption for trivial benefits. So if restaurant vouchers, for example, where the benefit does not 
exceed 50 pounds are given, they fall within the trivial benefit exemption and will be exempt. They would need to be non-cash uh, vouchers. So restaurant vouchers, for example, would be okay. Moving on now to something else that will be of particular interest to uh, attendees at this webinar. Uh, HMRC has been looking very closely at what they perceive to be abuse and fraud in relation to uh, R&D tax credits. This is particularly topical, as you might have seen in the newspapers and the tax technical press, that uh, the revenue re recently succeeded in a criminal prosecution uh, where R&D tax credits in relation to over hundred million pounds worth of completely unjustified claims for R&D were made. Um, the perpetrators have been uh, put into prison for long sentences and uh, I, I suspect there are more of these prosecutions in the pipeline. The approach adopted by HMRC and the Chancellor is that the payable R&D tax credits for SMEs are to be capped at a fairly low limit of £20,000 plus 300% of the company's total liability for PAYE and NIC during the accounting period concerned. This will take effect from 1 April 2021 and there will be special rules for accounting periods which straddle that date. Uh, this is probably going to make life more difficult for SMEs that contract out some of that R&D because it will be beneficial if they do it in-house and can use that 300% multi multiplier of the company's own PAYE and NIC. Uh, that's all I've got to say at the moment for the direct tax hot topics. So I'm now going to hand over to Mark. And uh, next slide, please, Chris. Thanks. Um, so the um, the pandemic uh, gave rise to um, some significant issues for businesses earlier this year, continues to do so. One of the, um, uh, the easements that was announced by the government was the ability to automatically defer payment of certain uh, VAT uh, liabilities um, earlier this year. Um, one of the requirements was, though, that you had actually filed a VAT return uh, for the, uh, it tended to be the March quarter, the April quarter, or the May quarter. There are other, um, there are other uh, months and periods that were affected, but those were the main. So um, a lot of people thinking they were having to pay that in full by 31 March 2021, uh, interest-free uh, by that point. The government has since announced um, uh, that they will have um, a scheme that you will register for in the new year if you want to do so to spread those payments um, over the year ending 31 March 2022. Um, one of the uh, key points that's uh, the, the thing I want to raise is it's being missed is that HMRC has uh, said that if your VAT returns that you filed earlier in the year where the VAT was deferred were wrong and you had too little VAT declared on those returns, you need to get your error correction notice uh, into HMRC before 31 December so that they can update their records and increase the amount of um, deferred VAT that is showing on their records. So a lot of people have missed that. So then with just over a week to go till the, the week in which um, Christmas Eve falls, this is something to, um, to, to act on urgently if you think any of your clients are in that position. Uh, this is so that when they, um, in the new year, uh, they see their deferred VAT amount on this portal, we think it will be, that they may say that they would like to spread payment of over the year ending 31 March 2022. It is the, it is the biggest amount. This is the amount it should be. Failing that, uh, if they have an error correction notice relating to the March, April or May quarter earlier this year, that they file next year, they will probably have to pay that in full. 
So uh, that is something to look at. That's it from me. Excellent. Thanks, you both. Um, right, over to questions. It's Chris here. Um, so if you've got any questions on what you've just heard, if you could like to put it in the um, in the Q&A box, the chat box, um, we will uh, then pick them up. So I uh, see, actually, I should say, I've noticed that if we go back two slides, the uh, Jeff conveniently um, skipped out the uh, corporate tax return final deadline. I think the yeah. only issue we we're going to say there was that um, the HMRC have issued some guidance around the reasonable excuse about late returns uh, and the fact you can you may be able to rely on reasonable excuse. So if you do look as if you're going to file some returns late, um, some corporate tax returns, then uh, check out, check the revenue guidance. I think that was all we're going to say. Is that right, Jeff? Did you yeah, want to add thank, anything? Thank, thanks for that, right. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Why. Um, otherwise, um, Claire has actually put a question in the chat. Uh, is the PAY NI uh, on the company only or the group? I think this is referring to the R&D stuff. Is, do you, are you, are you, is that, do you know enough about the R&D, R &D, Jeff, to uh, respond to that? No, I, I don't know the I don't know the answer to that. I suspect it may just be the company, and perhaps, perhaps I should also mention that there there is there, there is a, I've not mentioned it so far. There is apparently a, a a potential let out from the limit, where if the claimant company meets two tests, then its employees are creating, preparing to create, or actively managing IP. And that the expenditure on work contracted, subcontracted to a related party or external workers is less than 15% of the claimant's overall R&D expenditure. So, um, you know, in the interest of brevity, I, I only mentioned the basics, but uh, it, it, there are quite complex rules and each case needs to be looked at carefully on its own facts. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not sure right. whether, Claire, I'm not sure Claire, whether we could look at a group, but yeah. it seems to be on a company by company basis. As Claire, far as Claire says, she said Claire's added, they had previously said group, or, but, but perhaps that's just rumour. I'll tell you what, Claire, we'll have a quick check with the R&D guys and we'll, we'll give you a response. Yes, we will. Um, okay, well, um, no more questions have come up, so I would suggest we move straight on to uh, Mark and uh, Brexit Essentials. Thanks there. Um, even at this 11th hour, um, there are still many, many things being announced every day um, by uh, HMRC. But there are some things that um, I think are have been known for quite a while uh, to um, the tax advisor community, but maybe not so much to the, uh, the wider business community. I'm going to try and cover some of those now. These are things that will not be affected by any deal for want of a better word they will just this will just be things that will come to pass can you move on to the next slide please thank you so um vat um there's been a lot of talk about tariffs and customs declarations um but unless you're dealing in you know cars and food Customs duty rates may not be that high uh, for products. Uh, a lot of clients we speak to, their EU and UK customs duty is zero or a couple of percent. So uh, whilst that might be an inconvenient extra cost in the supply chain, um, it's not as big as potential 20% UK VAT or, as it is in other countries, higher amounts of VAT. Um, we tend to have one of the lower rates of VAT in Europe. Um, so one of the things that we've been looking at here is, um, is a VAT registration required in another EU country? Um, a lot of UK traders are used to this uh, because they hold stocks of goods in other countries, but this is probably for a different reason where um, they are either involved in intra-EU goods movements, say um, from Germany to France, and the UK company is an intermediary. Today, they've not had to register for that in Germany or France because of an EU easement called triangulation. However, they cannot benefit from that anymore um, unless they are established in Northern Ireland, which I will come to later. Um, so 
in that instance, uh, they would need to register for VAT in France or perhaps even Germany in order to remain involved in that Germany-France supply chain. So um, it's things like that uh, that we need to urgently look at with our clients. In terms of importer, so when, we, when you file a, a declaration at, at import, um, you have a declarant on there. Um, that is usually everything flows from that. So whichever entity has been named as the declarant um, will be liable for customs duty of due and import VAT. Now, sometimes it doesn't match. People will put um, a declarant name on a customs declaration that is not the owner of the goods. And that becomes quite critical. The um, HMRC has 18 months ago uh, and reiterated more recently that only the owner of the goods uh, is the uh, person who is entitled to recover uh, as import VAT on their VAT return form, import VAT paid on those goods as they arrive in the UK. Now, um, there has been a, a lot of focus on this uh, by people saying who, who owns goods at what point. Um, I'm going to destroy a myth for you. Uh, Inco terms, which people are focused on shipping terms, they are not indicative of ownership. They never have been. So just because something is DDP or XWorks means nothing in this perspective. Um, and in terms of customs duty, that's really all about declarants, as I've discussed. That's not about owner of goods either. So really, uh, you should be looking at more common sense uh, perspectives where if you have a, an exporter and an importer, it's pretty obvious that at import, the importer is the owner of the goods. It'd be weird if it wasn't. The difficulties arise where you have more than two parties in the chain. So I have seen situations where we have um, EU suppliers selling to their UK subsidiary, which then sells to a UK customer and the goods move direct. Not quite clear who the owner of the goods is at the time of import into the UK. So this is why this is critical. Um, should assume uh, nothing in this respect and, and check these things. Um, the last thing is here around fiscal representation. This was something um, that used to be all the rage across the EU um, because we can't trust a, a foreign person who's got a registration for VAT in our territory to always pay us the VAT. Whereas um, the EU said, we can't do that to each other. We can do it to non-EU entities, but we can't do it to each other. They said that many years ago, uh, but of course, the UK will now leave the EU. So the expectation is that many countries uh, may start requiring a, a UK business with a uh, EU VAT registration in their country to uh, appoint a local fiscal representative. Um, if they across the board for all UK businesses or perhaps on a risk-based approach, Ireland has, for example, mentioned that. So these are things to check if we have overseas VAT registrations. The last point on the overseas VAT registration I want to mention is uh, we see a lot of UK uh, e-tailers uh, registered for VAT because of distant selling uh, in other EU countries. Uh, that stops as well, unfortunately, because that again is an EU easement. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Oh, the latest on Northern Ireland. Crikey, this is a bit hard. So. We've got this situation where um, Northern Ireland will be, for all intents and purposes, treated as remaining in the EU Customs Union and the EU VAT area for goods movements. That's, that's kind of the overriding principle here. So you have to pretend that Northern Ireland is, 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 is out, outside what we come to think of as the UK, but it's Great Britain now uh, from 1 January. So um, that's the kind of mindset um, to have. So if you've got 
movements of goods between, say, France and Northern Ireland and you know, Ireland and Northern Ireland, these should be treated in the same way they are now. All those intra-community goods movements, rules, VAT, EC sales lists, interest app forms, they should all stay exactly the same as they are now. Um, the tricky bit is the goods movements between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So at the moment, um, HMRC has uh, set up a um, trader support service, uh, asking businesses that, uh, that are involved in those movements to register uh, with that service. Um, as I said, uh, there is a bunch of people there ready to do, to help do uh, export and import declarations for those GB Northern Ireland um, movements. Now, I think the I think the reason that um, is a is a bit odd, but works. I understand it is because usually when you have an export and an import, it's one tax authority in the country of exports and a different tax authority in the country of imports. So in this instance, it's the same tax authority in the country of export and import, which is HMRC. So they will be able, in effect, to do all this in the background on their computer systems. We still await further details of how this will work. We still await further details as to whether um, any EU customs duty will be, you know, in theory, charged or even collected as goods move from GB to Northern Ireland on the basis that they mark those goods might then got, go on into Ireland or France or Germany or other EU member states. And ditto the other way around. So if goods are in if, if are moving from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, we don't know if there's any plans to um, try and collect UK customs duty on those goods at the time of that movement. We don't know enough about uh, how the uh, HMRC and the government plan to, to deal with that. The last thing I would say on this is uh, about services. Um, v VAT and uh, services, um, in a sense, it's, a, it's quite a simple change. There's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of services where you say, um, where is my customer? And if it's anywhere in the EU, you may charge that. And if it's non-EU, you don't. So as an example, accountancy services or personal taxation services to a private individual within the EU provided by a UK accountancy firm would always be subject to UK VAT. That will change on 1 January. So we will say, ah, are they, um, are they outside the UK? as in GB in Northern Ireland. Uh, and that's all we will say. And then we will say, I will no longer charge UK VAT on them. So as far as we know, when it comes to services, it will be UK against the rest of the world. It's good where we have this split between GB and Northern Ireland. Could you move us on, please? Thank you. So, um, I mean, I've just spotted a typo there. UK EORI number, it's GB EORI number now. Things have moved on and you get a, an NI, Northern Ireland EORI number. Crikey, that's how, uh, that's how uh, things are moving on so fast. Um, uh, again, INCO terms, I've mentioned before, um, is, is can sometimes point you towards who the, uh, the owner may be, but by and large, they are there to tell you who is the um, responsible party for doing an import or an export declaration uh, or whose name they should be in. That's usually what that covers. Um, you do need to speak to, um, clients do need to speak to um, shippers um, because that's, that's what this um, uh, comes down to shippers and customers and suppliers to talk about um, who's going to do what, um, who's going to file import export declarations and what information that they don't already have they might need for it. Um, and then in terms of this point around capacity and third parties, again, um, speaking to uh, freight forwarders and making sure that they are able to deal with what you want them to deal with. 
many, many UK businesses have assumed that their freight forwarder would happily do an import declaration for them as their goods moved into Europe and have been dismayed that their freight forwarders have said, no, we won't do it for you because uh, we would be jointly and severally liable for um, EU customs duty and whatever import that in the relevant country would be due. And we don't want to take that risk. So we will not file those import declarations for you. So um, people um, scrabbling around trying to find alternative freight forwarders or even uh, Gulp actually putting their EU customer on the hook for um, the import declaration, which is something they're trying not to do. Um, the deferred declaration option, uh, which um, the UK is, uh, is, is offering uh, for the first six months, um, you should investigate whether you want to use them. Um, and if so, freight forwarders need to be instructed accordingly to do so. Much as freight forwarders also need to be instructed to, um, to, to, to let them know that you will be paying import VAT through your UK VAT return form rather than in the way that UK businesses have done to date either up front before the goods are cleared or by direct debit using a duty deferment account. Um, so if, you, if you're going to take this option, uh, which I'd be amazed if there's any UK businesses that don't want to take this option of paying import VAT through their VAT return form because that's very cash flow efficient, you need to tell their freight forwarders that they will be, um, they will be doing so. Um, and then I suppose... The last, the last two points are around just making sure that your um, IT systems can cope. Perhaps you need new VAT tax codes for services supplied to EU customers and Northern Ireland customers, sales of goods to Northern Ireland customers, and all these new things where actually you do want to break them out because they will have different treatments on VAT return forms. Um, and then, and then, and then trying to train your people on all this this new stuff. There are quite a few grant funding opportunities out there. So there is one uh, from HMRC. Uh, there are ones uh, more for, for SMEs uh, in England and Northern Ireland and Ireland. So there are quite a few grants out there available for training and consultancy. They can cover anywhere between 50% and 100% of the cost. So um, that's quite helpful when our clients want um, advice from us. Um, I'll stop there and we'll uh, just move on to the next slide if we could. Right, thanks I so much. I suppose, actually, let me just say <laughs> one last thing. I'll destroy another myth. UK EU free trade agreement. That is not going to help people who import goods from China. And I've had that conversation so many times with people. The point of a free trade agreement is to remove tariffs, customs duties on goods that are made, manufactured in the respective country. Too many of our clients, uh, I've realised, have just not twigged that because they import from China, any free trade agreement that might be reached between the EU and the UK is meaningless to them. That's just the last point I wanted to make. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, if anybody's got any more questions, please put them in the question and answers uh, box. There's nothing there at the moment. So I'll give it a moment before we move on. That's because it's all easy. It's not a problem. I think you've just blown their minds. You've certainly blown mine. It's times I'm glad I don't do that in customs. <laughs> um, right, no, nothing else there. So I think we're ready to move on to uh, Matt. Thank you, everyone. So this afternoon, I'd like to share um, just some thoughts on HMRC's so-called nudge letters. Um, if you could move the slide on, please. Thanks. Um, so starting at the beginning, what are nudge letters? Well, in their simplest form, nudge letters are letters issued by HMRC to encourage taxpayers to review their tax affairs and disclose to HMRC any anomalies. Um, it's a tactic used by HMRC to encourage taxpayers to review their tax affairs and take any necessary steps to ensure that they're UK tax compliant. Typically, letters will be sent to groups of taxpayers and those identified as being more likely to have made errors or omissions in their tax filings. The question of why do HMRC use nudge letters? Well, 
the use of nudge letters more generally is born out of research into behavioural science. Uh, the government recognised that it could use a better understanding of behaviour to improve public services and inform policy. But, uh, 10 years ago, a so-called nudge unit was established who stated that by understanding better how people respond to different contexts and incentives, they could develop a more nuanced understanding of human behaviour that can ultimately help design more interventions to tackle fraud, error and debt. Now, there are seven key principles which underpin the use of nudge letters, which I'll, I'll read out, and these are categorised under the following headings. Make it easy, highlight key messages, use personal language, prompt honesty at key moments, tell people what others are doing, reward desired behaviour, highlight the risk and impact of dishonesty. Now, HMRC were keen to make use of this new approach, so ran an early trial based on one of those principles, the telling people what others were doing. They found that by writing to taxpayers, informing them that nine out of 10 people in their area had already paid their tax resulted in substantial increases in tax payments. As well, of course, it's been a very effective tool which HMRC can use. It's also a very low cost way of targeting a wide group of taxpayers. When do HMRC send them? Well, HMRC will send them out periodically when they have intelligence that a particular group of taxpayers are likely to require a nudge to review their tax filings. One example of this is nudge letters targeted at those who uh, were known to have offshore interests. And this went to over 40,000 taxpayers in the months prior to the requirement to correct period. And the information intelligence that prompts HMRC to issue nudge letters derives from their Connect computer system, which I'll touch on a little bit more on the next slide. Um, on the question of can HMRC still open inquiries? Well, I'm afraid, yes, of course they can. The purpose of nudge letters is really to reduce the number of inquiries and investigations HMRC has to commence. Unfortunately, it's very unlikely that they will ever replace inquiries. Now, you could look at it, the use of nudge letters allows HMRC to essentially outsource a lot of their investigation work to taxpayers and their advisors. What HMRC ultimately wants is taxpayers who need to regularise their tax affairs to come forward rather than the other way around. And on the final points on the slide, what about penalties and the link to nudge letters? Well, the simple answer is there's no direct link, but there is a relationship between the two. So receiving a nudge letter will not automatically mean a penalty will be charged, but nor does it mean that a penalty won't be charged. Where the relationship exists between the two is on the question of whether a disclosure made on the back of receiving a nudge letter was prompted or not. That, as you probably know, has an impact on the level of penalty charged. Unfortunately, what we don't benefit from here is a consistent approach because HMRC, with some nudge letters, sorry, take the view that due to the issuing of a nudge letter and a subsequent disclosure being made, then it is prompted, whereas with other nudge letters, They've said the opposite. Now, just a sort of final comment on this slide and to, to add some balance. Um, we see far too many cases of HMRC issuing nudge letters to taxpayers when HMRC already has sufficient information to show that there is an honest and often simple explanation as to why income or gains may have been admitted from a tax return. For example, where a taxpayer files on the remittance basis, so would never have needed to report their offshore income and gains on the tax return, they then receive a nudge letter. And also with nudge letters, HMRC asks the taxpayer to complete a certificate of tax position with some of the nudge letters. Now, if they, uh, the criticism really there is it does not say on that nudge letter that supports the certificate of tax position that there is no legal obligation to complete the certificate. And what a lot of people won't know is that should they return a certificate that turns out to be inaccurate, then they can be potentially be prosecuted on the basis of providing HMRC with uh, inaccurate information. So go to the next slide. Thank you. So HMRC Connect system, which I mentioned before, um, most I'm sure most people listening will uh, be familiar with HMRC's um, Connect system. But for those who aren't, it's essentially HMRC's supercomputer that's been designed to help HMRC identify those who are understating or underpaying their tax liabilities. It costs more than hundred million pounds to develop and pulls information and data from a variety of sources to risk profile groups of taxpayers and identifies those who may become a target of a nudge letter, HMRC campaign, 
a disclosure facility or, or even a tax inquiry. Now, I said it can pull data from a variety of sources, and some of these will include, for example, uh, Visa and MasterCard transactions, DVLA, uh, UK bank accounts, overseas bank accounts, if there's uh, data being exchanged under the common reporting standard, council tax payments, uh, eBay, Gumtree, social media, and, and the list just goes on. Now, with all of the data within Connect, the system then compares this to details HMRC already holds elsewhere to try and spot anomalies. So to give you an example, if I were involved in numerous transactions selling items on eBay, the system might look to see whether I'm completing the self-employed pages on my tax return. If I'm not, then the Connect system might flag me as either a person or being within a group of people that may need a nudge to correct my behavior or at least to review it. Now, interestingly, we know that 90% of inquiries are now started because Connect has spotted something that requires further investigation. So it's positive that HMRC are increasingly making better use of technology and nudge letters are another cost effective way HMRC can increase the tax take. However, we shouldn't forget not to panic if one of our clients receives a nudge letter. The system is only as good as the information that you put into it. So our job is to question why that information might be wrong. And if it is, consider the appropriate route to regularize matters if it's not. So on to the next slide. Thank you. And, and this is really why I wanted to touch on nudge letters this afternoon. You can see on the slide 15 um, nudge letters which have been sent since September 2020. So HMRC had been busy working at home whilst, whilst in lockdown. Um, I haven't seen examples of all of these in practice, um, but certainly ATED gains on residential property and the outstanding 1718 tax return letters are ones that I'm sure many people will have seen. Thank you, next slide. And I think that's it from me. So thank you for, for listening to a quick canter through nudge letters. All right, um, if anyone has any questions, please drop them in the questions and answer box. I've had a couple, both from Claire again. Um, I think this first one's for Mark, because it came up just after we, uh, just after Matt started. If we have a panic, who do we call at BDO? And I think the answer is Mark, Rob or Marvin, who's our, our VAT team. Given um, everybody else seems to be on holiday when anybody calls, it's me. <laughs> yes, right. Um, yeah, you. The normal, the normal method to uh, contact the VAT team is either to email them, them directly. I would normally suggest emailing two or three of them at the same time, just in case someone's away. Um, or you can contact uh, the tax line in the, in the same way. We will simply email them anyway. So if you email them direct, you'll just replicate what we would do. So, um, yeah, so it's Marvin, it's, it's Mark uh, or Rob or Marvin who are uh, the team in, uh, in Birmingham who look after the VAT line queries. So um, that's the answer there. Um, Claire's also asked on the, uh, for Matt, can you settle an office argument for me? Do the bank send details of account balances to HMRC or only the details of interest received? So it's really what comes under the CRS, what information does the revenue get under CRS? Yeah, I, I can, I think, settle an office argument, which is good news. <laughs> they, they, they receive uh, information on the interest, not necessarily the bank balances. Um, but, you know, if you're talking about CRS and you're talking about... Um, you know, people with um, overseas bank accounts, but they'll get any information where the account holder has an address in the UK. So there's really quite a lot of information that's being shared, but in the short answer is no, they, they don't get account balances, just, just details of interest received. Well, that, that answer. Um, there's no other questions come in, so just gave them a moment, but... Uh, uh, Otherwise, I will say while I've got the space, um, just to uh, just a minute, we will be sending out um, some feedback forms, I believe. Uh, I would encourage anyone who can to uh, to fill them in and respond because it's very important. There's only the second one of these sessions we've done through Zoom. So in particular, we'd like people's thoughts on is the timing. We've certainly got more people now at two o'clock than we had at 10 o'clock on the last one. So does that mean the afternoon's better for you. Um, how, how are you finding Zoom as a platform to use? Um, what did you think about the topics and how it's structured and, and you know, how generally, how useful is, is, is attending this event being? I mean, anything along those lines, as long as the normal, you know, how well did uh, the speaker speak, but that's a given. Um, so yeah, so any, any key, we, we would really like to get any feedback. So a form will come along, um, but if you feel necessary, just drop an email to myself 
uh, if need be, Chris Holmes or chris.holmes at bdo.co.uk. Um, otherwise, it's uh, it's just a case of uh, thanking the speakers, um, thanking yourselves for turning up uh, and uh, and saying uh, good afternoon and have, have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>